So we'll kick off, um, Laura. Laura, I'm absolutely delighted to have you here uh, today with us on the data transformation series with the Digital Transformation Lab in UCC. Uh, Laura, I've come across books you've written previously, it must be going back about a decade ago now in the area of data quality. For me, you're one of the pioneers in that field. Can you tell us a bit about yourself, uh, Laura? Sure, Patty, yeah. So I've been a, a data quality practitioner since about 2003. I started officially in 2003 in a job in uh, at United Health Group. Um, as of September 2021, I am now the Data Quality Director at Prudential Financial, which is a US-based financial services and insurance company. Um, and you mentioned the books. I, I, was, uh, I have two books on data quality, one that I published in 2013, Measuring Data Quality for Ongoing Improvement. And I just published a second book on data quality in February of 2022 called um, meeting the challenges of data quality measurement or data quality management. And uh, I was also involved with the uh, creation of DEMA's data management body of knowledge. The second edition it was published in 2017. And I wrote a short book, uh, kind of uh, cliff notes to the, the DM Bach called Navigating the Labyrinth. So I've looked at data quality management uh, both in the details, you know, how do you construct meaningful measurement uh, of particular kinds of data, and in the in the bigger picture, uh, certainly the the opportunity I had to work on the DM Bach was a an education in itself. Um, so it's uh, I, I'm very very interested in how we create data. Uh, how you uh, ensure that data is of high quality and usable. And I've come at it kind of from both ends. Um, so you can tell that, you know, for the past two decades, data has really been the focus of my career. And I, I had a very fortunate beginning. Um, when I started working in data quality management, it really was in its early stages as a as a profession. And I had the opportunity to uh, meet a lot of people who were uh, just getting things going. So I attended uh, both a, a, a week-long course at Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Um, and then I uh, attended conferences there for many years. And the group that was working on data quality management there, they were doing it largely from an academic point of view. It was led by Richard Wang and, and there were you know, a, a set of people that were really um, exploring it and trying to set it up. Um, so I was exposed to that and, and able to participate, but I also had that, that hands-on situation where I was trying to apply these ideas uh, right from the start. So I, it was a very fortunate uh, confluence of, of events for me. Um, but I think the, the thing that has really driven my career is, is just that I find data itself incredibly interesting. Um, I, <laughs> I think it's remarkable what you can see in data. You know, I worked in healthcare for many years, and uh, one of the first things I had to do was uh, just look at referential integrity between um, diagnosis codes in, you know, in, in and in claim data and diagnosis codes in the book of diagnosis codes. And first of all, it was eye-opening just to see uh, how that information was encoded. And then when you would look at a set of claims, you could see patterns in the claims, and and uh, you could see differences between um, how claims were uh, paid and, and then those kinds of things. And I just thought, wow, you know, if you do this right, you can learn so much. So uh, I find, I just find data extremely interesting. It, how it represents the activities of an organization, uh, how by taking it seriously and engaging it, you can understand better the functions of that organization. Uh, I think it's a remarkably powerful uh, tool of, you know, really a, a creation of the human brain to 
to try to understand things. So I find it fascinating. And I think I've a sense we've shared sort of a similar b background, you know, in terms of coding, diagnosis, et, et cetera. So uh, I, I completely get it. And I, I love the, your your remark as well, uh, Laura, though, that it's, it's remarkable what you can see when you look at the data. I also think it's remarkable what organisations don't see because they don't look at the data. And I know I've heard you before. I'm not sure where exactly, or it could have been in one of the books, Laura, talk about, you know, that data quality should be common sense, you know, uh, except we're still in a very similar situation. Well, some would argue we haven't maybe matured as much as we should in terms of data quality. Why is that, do you think, uh, Laura? Yeah, it's it's interesting that you, you phrase it that way. Um, so I think there are a lot of things that get in the way of our understanding of data. And, and one of them is just human nature. <laughs> uh, you know, I um, many years ago now, I read uh, Daniel Kahneman's book, Thinking Fast and Slow. And uh, you know you're familiar with the book. He he's a, an economist, a behavioral economist, and he tries to understand how how people react to information and make decisions. And he's uncovered some peculiarities. You know, like um, the end of an experience will color the how you understand the entire experience. Um, you know, so if it ends well, if all's well that ends well is actually true. <laughs> um, if something ends well, you remember it positively. If it ends badly, uh, you remember it negatively, even though if you look at it in, in an objective way, um, you can uh, see, you know, you could measure positive impact or negative impact. So um, I, I recently read his book called Noise, which is a collaboration with several other thinkers. And he focuses in on that book on the concept of judgment, like objective judgment. If you have information uh, about, um, let's say, a medical condition, uh, you would think that if two doctors have the same information, that they would reach similar conclusions about the diagnosis. And what he sees in the data is that this isn't the case, that many things interfere with that ability to judge. And, and he focuses very, very narrowly on situations where you would think you could and should, that two people can and should re reach the same conclusion. So what he shows is there are many factors that can uh, interfere with or can influence, right, to influence the conclusions that people draw. And most of them are not rational. <laughs> most of them are not rational. So I think th this book made me think deeply again about how we work with data. Mm. And I, I really think one of the huge gaps is education in data. You know, how data works, what the limits of data are, uh, and what thought processes people need to engage in in order to use data. Uh, I just think that that's the missing piece. We tend to, we tend to talk about data as if it pre-exists us. Um, it doesn't. We have to construct a system to collect it. We have to uh, put it through paces in terms of uh, processing to, to use it and understand it. And so if we know that if we know more about how it works, we and we see both its limits and its potential insight, we I think we can draw better conclusions. But honestly, I really think it's a it, it's such a discipline to use data. And, and a lot of people, especially with all the hype around data, a lot of people forget that part or they're not even aware of it. You know, I've read some some books, not just articles, you know, not just sort of uh, advertisements for tools, but actual books that have been published where they're so uh, enthusiastic about data and and what it can do that they don't account for the risks. They don't account for the work involved with understanding it and such. So 
I, I think that that really what gets in the way is we have all these assumptions that make us excited about data, but many people don't realize how much, how, what it takes to actually use it and, and use it effectively. Uh, what a lovely answer to know. And, uh, and I think you're, you're spot on, uh, Laura, you know, the, the question is why are we still not doing what we, we know we should be doing? I love the reference to Daniel Kahneman, that system one thinking. We're cognitively yeah. very lazy and we're emotional and uh, we're probably predictably irrational, if, if anything. Uh, and I know as well, Laura, you, you've said you know that people matter when it comes to data quality. And I know that's something I want to come back to afterwards. Uh, I also know you, you sort of reference maybe um, our friend Tom Redmond, you know, about you know the cost of poor data quality can be as much as 15 to 25 percent of the revenue of organizations and I and to tie it back into your last point I know you also talk about you know uh, the deniers data deniers I think you, you you call it can you tell us a little bit about that because I think it ties in really nicely with that that you know that that cognitive element that the way we look at data sometimes is the problem yeah, yeah. So this concept of data deniers is is something I've been working with. Um, I haven't actually published it in my in my recent book, but I drafted it as part of that and 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 thought through it. So I there are in most organizations, people find quality difficult. <laughs> you know, it feels hard, and it and there are parts that are challenging. Um, but they they want to um, they they want it they want the data to be right, but they don't want to take responsibility for making it right. And so this this response to the the threat of poor quality data takes various forms. You know, you can have people who will out and out say, "Oh, the data is fine." <laughs> There's not a problem, <laughs> you know. Why do they say that? Because they aren't the people that are using the data, you know. And then there's other people that will will say, um, you know, I know the data is bad, but I can't do anything about it. It's not anywhere under my control. And and um, and then there are people that think, you know, if it's not if 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 you can't get it perfect, um, then you shouldn't do anything at all to improve it. <laughs> you know, like, oh, we can't fix everything, so therefore we will fix nothing. You know, it takes these different forms. And I think it is because, uh, you know, if you want to have better data, it's like wanting to have better anything. Um, you have to, uh, you, you have to think it through and you, and you have to work on it apart at a time, right? Or, but you, you need to also keep the big picture in mind, right? So I think of it in terms of physical exercise. I think that in this day and age is the easiest analogy to draw, right? If if you are out of shape, you don't go from being out of shape to being in shape in in one easy step, right? You have to you have to uh, pick the pick what you want to work on and you have to do it in a disciplined way. And you can't do everything at once, but as you do one part, you get better at the other parts, right? So if you're focusing on your core, um, and then you uh, and then you want to work on your cardio, the fact that your core is in better shape is going to help, you know, you get in shape with your cardio. And so I feel like organizations should kind of think about that in terms of their data quality. Um, you know, if you have a problem with your customer data. And you have a problem with your producer data, uh, you could work on both of those at the same time, or you could focus on one and make the improvements, and and then you know go and focus on the other. And in fact, interestingly, there is good data to support <laughs> the mm -hmm. fact that if you work on one data set um, or one area of your business, then other areas will improve, even even though you're not actively working on them. So um, a, a former colleague of mine at uh, Cigna, Rajesh Jagulam, wrote a book on uh, data quality management, and he's a statistician. And um, he showed that if you do improvements in one area, and you can, you can see measurable improvements in other areas. So it, I really think that um, 
you need a holistic approach you, to data quality management, and then you need focused activities. Mm -hmm. So you need to have that uh, that cultural backdrop where you have support for improvement in quality, and then you need to choose what to focus on first and actually go through a program of work whereby you can make improvements in different areas. And that really has has several effects. You know, one of one of those effects is you're working with a team on on one area of data quality improvement and they make progress, you can uh, show other people how that works. And then they and then when you work with them, they're prepared you know, to make make changes themselves. So, you know, we we are predictably irrational, <laughs> as Kahneman says, but we can uh, we can also use that knowledge to to build a program of work to really uh, to really help an organization uh, grow and improve. And I'm a I'm a true believer in this, even though it's it, you know in some ways it's a it's a difficult battle. Right, um, but every time you have an example of improvement, it, it's potentially eye-opening for other other people. And you know, Tom Redmond's uh, work on this uh, on the cost of poor quality. I reference that very frequently because he's he's very straightforward, common sense. Look at this. You know, you're leaving money on the table, or you're wasting money, and it, you you just have to keep repeating that message. Um, I think corp you know corporations are like big giant people, <laughs> not that they should you know mm -hmm. have the right to vote or anything like that. <laughs> um, but um, you know they there is a kind of mindset, and so it's um, it, it, if you can if you can be preaching common sense, which Tom Redman is always preaching common sense, then. Uh, you can be, you can make headway, mm. and that can last if you do it the right way. Yeah, uh, and I think that's, and I think again, it's a really a powerful point to know that we nearly need to find those wins, uh, broadcast the wins, and encourage others. I, I think for me, uh, Laura, I know I'm, I was really struck by you. You, I would call them foundational questions that nearly out. Uh, the organization in terms of its attitude towards data quality and what it's going to do about uh, about it. Um, I, I don't know if you remember those three questions, but they had a big uh, uh, impact on me and I think our audience w w would find it very interesting to know about to know what is data quality, what does poor data quality look like? And then the final question, what are we going to do about it? Can you tell us about a bit about those questions? Because I think they're really foundational. Yeah, so um, I'm glad that you referenced the three questions. They are really at the core of how I like to talk about uh, data quality with people. And I, I learned those questions uh, or I started thinking about the data quality in that way, uh, in part uh, because David Plotkin, who wrote a book on data stewardship, um, now in its second edition, he and I had a mutual colleague, and she had actually used those questions as an early version of those questions as a way of trying to talk to people about data quality. She was a, a technology executive, and um, and she wanted she she didn't want to spend time on data quality unless she had. Uh, had somebody who was engaged uh, in a meaningful way. And so when she asked those questions, um, I started thinking about them as, as really the foundational questions. So you just recited them. I'll unpack them a little bit. The first is, what do we mean by high quality data? Right? And that's, uh, that is a foundational question because if you don't know what, you want, then it's hard to get it, <laughs> right? So uh, that question, what do we mean by high quality data, can be answered in a in a range of ways, right? You can you can set standards for for quality. Um, you can talk about uh, what a what a situation looks like if the data is all of high quality. You know, 
would will be able to transact business in this way you know that question kind of aligns well with an agile mindset of you know what are we what are we trying to accomplish what what do people want to do with the data right as a as a customer service representative i want to be able to x y or z and then you can you can say in order to do that i need complete customer information i need access to the to the inventory you know whatever those answers might be so that question of actually saying what is it what it, what does it mean to have high quality data and then the second question a lot of people find it hard to envision what high quality means but they know when they don't have it <laughs> right so the second question you know how do we detect poor quality data is what i call the dark underbelly of the first question like oh we had a disastrous situation where you know we uh we put the last name in the first name field and suddenly you know we're talking you know to mr mary and you know he he doesn't he's not happy she's not happy um so answering that second question about detection informs the first question it gives you more insight into what can go wrong but it also allows you then to talk about how you would measure it right because when i when i think about the dimensions of data quality the definition i use is a dimension of quality is a measurable characteristic of data um and so you think about well how do you actually detect when things go wrong you have to think in terms of of finding those errors and and actually measuring them um and that again that gives you insight into what the data might look like and then the final question is really the important one because all the all the theory about what makes data good or bad is important only if you're using it <laughs> mm. you know and so you say okay you know maybe you you might find a problem with data that has no material effect on your relationship with your customers or your vendors or or the like and you don't really want to spend any time on that and that's fine it's in a sense you should the thing you should do is not even collect that data right um but if you find real problems you have to ask yourself the question what are we going to do and that question is really about the the values of the organization you know what what is important to the organization uh to address and what is is not important enough to address so for most organizations what's in, what's most important to address is their relationship with their customers and especially you know the products and services that they sell so they want to represent those things they want to represent themselves in their products and services completely accurately and and in a way that their customers can understand them and they want to make sure they know their customers right know where they live know how to contact them that kind of thing so when you put those things together often that the answer to that question what are we going to do about it is not so much a data question <laughs> as a customer service question or a, a product improvement question and if if we can see it that way then it doesn't become a question of you know how do we get the data perfect but how do we actually serve our customers how do we improve what we do and data is part of that because data is a means by which we know those things it's not in and of itself the goal but it's a means to an end so the i i hope that when i hope that with those questions uh people can see the role that data plays within the organization rather than just thinking about the data itself because if if the emphasis is only on the data then it, it the work doesn't get done because people recognize whether they say it or not they recognize that the the data itself is not uh the goal it's how you use it and what you do with it powerful and like if if people take anything away from 
this session, I think even those three questions are so, so important. I think even the discussions they can give rise to uh, help that maturing of organizations, you know, attitudes, behaviors uh, towards uh, data quality. And I, I really, really like them, uh, Laura. I, I'm struck, Laura, but, uh, you know, I, I remember recalling, you know, or I recall, you know, maybe you, you define data quality around the application of, of um, maybe quality management techniques to uh, data. And I think for me, your first book, you know, uh, measuring data quality for ongoing improvement was very sort are typical of that. It, it, it was an exemplar of, of that. Whereas I felt, and and it's it's a question more than anything that really you've been bringing the human bit in more and more as the years have have gone by. You know, even even your answers now talking about it, it can't just be about the data. It must be about what the business are trying to do with data. Is that a fair summary? Yeah, you know, thank you for saying that. Actually, this. Um, I had a convert. I was at a conference a couple weeks ago, and I had a conversation where uh, I, I was talking about that very thing. Um, and what I said was, you know, when I first started this work, I was so fascinated by data and what we could do, how we could collect it. Even, yeah, I'm not a technology freak, but I, I like, I was fascinated by what you could do, like how you could move the data around and and rearrange it, and you know use technology to analyze it and it all seems so apparent to me that wow you got to get the data right and then all these other things happen right and and when i started really thinking about the work and what are the what are the reasons that we don't do this right you know the question that you asked earlier what gets in the way um and i've and that has been the focus of of my attention certainly uh you know, for the past five, six years, because it, it, I, I, we've got to, we've got to improve on, on the human aspect of it, or we can't do the other things, right? So the two things that I've been thinking a lot about in, well, really sort of three things, right? Um, so first of all, in a new book, I talk about the challenges of, of managing uh, data quality. And I break them into people, process, technology, the data itself, and culture. And the data itself is is really a proxy. And it's another proxy for people, <laughs> right? The relationship between data and people, how people understand data, how they work with data, uh, what they expect from data. That's like one part of the equation that hasn't really been explored in even in the quality literature, right? Like there's not a, a lot of discussion about how the people that are trying to manufacture a product, how they interact with that product. And of course, data is is different from other other products. So I've been thinking about that a lot. Um, this whole concept of data quality deniers was sort of a a quick and dirty way of trying to think about what gets in the way, you know. Um, I've done a lot of thinking on uh, about data literacy. Uh, so I um, I didn't share this earlier, but I have a I have a PhD in literature. So I got into data management in a you know through not through the usual route. Let's just say that, and. Um, I, I, I very much care about uh, literacy in general because I think literacy is empowering and education is empowering, but people kind of fight against it. <laughs> you know, they, they it's work. It's a kind of work that, and some people don't want to engage in it. They don't necessarily see uh, the benefits somehow. Um, so I feel like the what we really need to do if we're going to get more value out of data is first of all enable people to understand data itself better. I call I refer to this as data as data. Um, secondly, under, help people understand the relationship between data and their organization. So how data represents their organization and the work that they do and the work that their colleagues do. And then 
you know, how they can use it and and what it you know what it means to use it so some of that is the skills that you need to be able to manipulate data and the like uh, but also the knowledge you need to understand it and so i i have become more and more interested in the people aspect and the and the the other two things so one is data literacy the other is culture in it written big in a in an organization, leadership, and how we govern data, and 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 those kinds of things, and then, and I hate this word, but I'm using it anyway. Uh, stewardship, um, and not stewardship, not data stewardship in the way that it often gets implemented in organizations where we're gonna we're gonna get an army of stewards and we're and they're gonna do all this stuff that nobody else wants to do and everything. But what does it mean to actually care for something that isn't yours, but that you have a stake in and that, uh, you know, that you really, that if you're able to help the organization uh, get better at managing its data and using its data, you know, you're making a real contribution. And if others help, the organization itself really benefits but it's not as recognizable as you know upping your sales numbers by 15 <laughs> percent mm -hmm. you know so there's there's this kind of work involved with it that is really um it it really requires that people be committed in it and and i think they need knowledge and education to to build that commitment mm -hmm. so yeah there's a whole people aspect of this mm -hmm. that i yeah. think yeah, it just, you know, and, <laughs> you know, I, when I think about this, like, my, my uh, inclination is to look at the, to build frameworks, right, to, to have a big picture and then get the details right and have that just the way I want it, you know, and, um, but, that doesn't, that only gets you so far because if you're going to get this work done, you need people who, who can understand what they're trying to do, why they're trying to do it, and who themselves have individual commitment. It, it is not, it is, it is definitely a team sport. It is not an individual sport. And at a certain point, I recognize that and I'm like, okay, what I need to do to be successful in my career is I need to pay attention to people in a in a different way from how I had been paying attention and I need to figure out how to engage them. Mm. So that has been what I've been trying to do. Yeah. It's interesting no. that you recognize it because I no, really it's been, Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's been a lovely journey watching it actually, uh Lord, on your journey, because I think in a way it has also in fact, maybe you're leading the way I was going to say it, it sort of mimics what we should be doing in terms of, of uh, the maturity of data quality, but maybe we should be following that maturity in your own thinking, you know, that it, it, it is increasingly about the people. And I love the way you call out data literacy and culture. It, it's been interesting and, and a good few of the interviews we've done already, Laura, people talking about that maybe it's moving from a data driven culture to a value creation culture and that we need to figure out the role of of data within the, the broader value generation uh, i suppose um question does that resonate with you yeah so it's it's interesting this con this concept of data driven you know um I, i'm not sure if tom redmond originated the the term itself but obviously he wrote the book data driven and um which is just a, a really, really good book. And part of what he is uh, talking about there is how do you get people to recognize the role that data plays and how it works, you know? Um, and he, I, I, I read another book on data literacy and I can't even remember which one. And the person said, you know, we don't wanna be data driven we want to be um, data influenced, and I thought, let's not let's not weaken <laughs> the concept of data driven, because again, I go back to the analogy of getting physically fit, right? You you have you know you have to be focused, you have to 
if you if you want to improve physically, if you want to improve mentally, you have to practice, you have to exercise, right? And the fact is, people talk about data, they buy uh, enormous tools that are supposed to help them get more value from data, but they don't, but they haven't necessarily done the work they need so that they are smarter about data. And I think a big part of what Redmond's getting to in that book is being smart about data. Now, that said, and I mean, Redmond is, I don't know if he's been part of your series or not, but you know, he's just incredibly smart. And, and he has thought about this for a long time and has done a lot of really good work that, uh, you know, that, that applies the very principles that he's talking about. So he's trying to get people to think in a different way. One of the things that's totally fundamental to his work, to the work at, at MIT, and, and I think as well to my own work and Danette McGilvery's work, is this quality as a, as a holistic approach. And so, again, the data is not an end in itself. The data is a way that an organization can uh, help meet its own goals. So I kind of feel like any, any organization that wants to be data-driven is, <laughs> it doesn't want to be data-driven. It wants to meet its goals. <laughs> and data is one of the means to meeting those goals. Mm -hmm. So I, I do think we need to talk about these things in different ways, but it's not an either or. It's really about the relationship between these things. Um, I read an, an article that was written in like early 2000s by one of the big consulting firms. I can't remember if it was McKinsey or, or Deloitte or somebody else, but um, they basically said, you know, if you don't know your data, you don't know your business. And, and I keep coming back to that because that's, that's the core of it. So it's not an end in itself, but it's a really, really important part of knowing how your organization is performing. And I feel like if we can get that message out, if we can remind people, it's not not an end in itself, but if it's not right, you're going to have yeah. you know the wrong information. <laughs> you know, and, and I love it, Laura, because I think you've stuck to your guns. The easy answer to my question would be, you know, uh, to, uh, to simplify. And and I think there's even a move in society now of taking discipline out of everything, you know, nearly oversimplifying, yeah. making things sound nearly too easy. Whereas for me, what you're saying is, no, no, it is still critical. There's a discipline to this, you know, and we yeah. need to continue doing this. So I'd say good on you, Laura. I, I, I'm glad <laughs> it wasn't the easy answer. Laura, you, you mentioned earlier there though that, and I think you're, you're spot on, and, and I would really advocate for people to look at your books. I think you've a real skill of taking lots of information and producing frameworks or, or, or you know, um, models, etc. I was intrigued by one, and maybe we'll sort of start to land our plane in terms of this um, uh, discussion on that. It was the sale, you know? I, again, I, I think it, it was a very, for me, it was a very human approach to data, you know? It was about starting small, uh, sort of a DAs always prioritizing, you know? Then it's a circle, and then it's about learning and learning from everyone, and 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 sort of nearly going around that. I just felt it was a real. If there was a discipline to it, but it was also very human. Can you tell us a little about a bit about where that came from? Yeah. So the, yeah, the acronym SAIL. I was trying to figure out some way to condense what I think is a fairly simple message, which is, you know, you're near the end of my book. I've told you a lot of complicated things. You may feel overwhelmed right now, and that you can't do it. Um, so what? what is the what is the way you approach it right and uh you know what what you just summarized patty that you know i i tend to produce these complicated frameworks um or not complicated because they're i think they're well organized <laughs> but you know there's a lot of information and and when people see them 
they they have uh, two responses. One is they're like, oh, wow, this makes sense. And then they're like, oh, I can't do all of that. Mm-hmm. Right. And and they miss the part where I say you don't have to do all of it. And you don't have to do all of it at once. So sale starts with um, keep it. Stay simple. Stay simple uh, or start simple, but keep the big picture in mind. So one of the one of the key things like with even with the measurement framework that I published in the first book, people have asked me, have you implemented that whole framework? And I've said no, because <laughs> you don't have to. You know, you pick and choose. It's more of a menu. Um, what are the things your organization needs? What are the what are the ways that your organization thinks about data or what are the problems they have? You know, start with start with the problems you're trying to solve. But keep in mind what you're trying to achieve overall. So start start simple, but keep the big picture in mind. And then um, the second one is always prioritize, right? There there are many with data. We've been doing uh, work on profiling and looking at relatively old data sets um, and uh, and trying to you know summarize what we're seeing. It doesn't mean we have to act on every single one of them. You always have to look at what's going to pay off, right? Um, the the third one is probably the most important because um, people think when you look at an improvement cycle that you have to you have to start right at the beginning, right? Um, so the third act, the, the I in sale is it's a circle for a reason. And I have in the book, uh, um, my version of a improvement cycle. And I start with defining data quality and then, you know, um, assessing data, managing issues, um, monitoring data and, and improving data. Um, but you really can start anywhere in that, in that cycle. You know, if if you're working for a company and there is a, a big data issue, you don't have to start by defining data quality. You look at that issue <laughs> and you figure out what's wrong and you act on what you know. And then whatever you learn from that, you you can apply and you can say, oh, we not only did we resolve this issue, but now here we have three standards that we going forward will apply to our data you know um and then the final one and i think the most important is learn from everything you do and everybody that you meet um so the l in sale is about learning and that is um that is true in data quality and it's true in my opinion in in everything (laughs) um i uh you know i mentioned earlier that i have I have a PhD in literature, and uh, I had the opportunity one summer to do a, um, a, a national endowment for the humanities uh, six-week program, and it actually was uh, in Sligo. We were studying Yeats, so I had I had uh, I did this um, course, and. I was there with uh, 12 other people who were all about Yates and I had studied Yates and I thought I knew everything about Yates and I came back and I was gonna teach um, a, a section on Yates. And uh, I, I go through the first poem and one of my students asked a question and I wish I had written this down at the time. He asked a question that I had never thought about before. I never thought about it. It, despite you know really deeply study having read like every poem he ever wrote having done this six-week course with people that were all very deeply knowledgeable and then i come and a freshman student asked a question none of us had asked and and i thought to myself wow <laughs> you know what that means is you never know who you're going to learn from so you have to be attentive you know you have to actually pay attention to people and you have to be open to what they're seeing and the questions that they're asking. And it doesn't mean every single one is equally valuable, but that openness itself will help the process because you, you again, you never know what, um, what someone's gonna bring to the table and you want the table to, to be a place where they can bring things. 
Mm. So, yeah, so that um, I, I was struggling with the problem of how to help people better understand what I was trying to show them and not be um, put off by it you know, if it, 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 by the density or by the perceived complexity and try to welcome them in and say, no, you know, you don't have to do everything. Um, you, you know, figure out what's going to work for you. Because we have to help each other with this stuff. <laughs> That's it. And, and I think, I, I think it's a lovely, it's a lovely acronym. I think the way you've described it is lovely. I think also there's, it's not only a minimum viable discipline. Look, if you're going to do it, this, these are the things you should be doing. And, and I really like that. Laura, it all, it's also intriguing me that, uh, I, I think nearly all the guests so far have had some connection back to Ireland uh, from where we're we're obviously recording today, Laura. So it's great to hear that and uh, mention of lovely Sligo and, and, and hopefully we'll get you back here at, at some stage again. And, and Laura, for people listening to this, and I, I'm sure uh, the depth of knowledge, the depth of passion you have for data quality, data management is clear. How can people find out more about you? How can they follow uh, your evolving story? Yeah, so I'm I'm always uh, I'm always open to uh, connecting via LinkedIn. That's sort of the only social media I really engage in actively. Um, uh, my my books are. Uh, on Amazon, and uh, you know, I, since I'm working for a corporation, I'm not, you know, consulting or or the like, as many of your guests, I'm sure, are. Um, but I still really like being engaged in the conversation. Um, Pre-pandemic, I I attended uh, numerous conferences, including Enterprise Data World, which is a big one in the U.S., but has a an international, certainly an international contingent. Um, and I would I would say, you know, if if people can reach out to me at, on LinkedIn and if if anybody comes to a conference, please introduce yourselves. And, you know, I, I really like to talk about this stuff. I like to understand where people are in their journeys and what they're seeing and uh, what challenges they are trying to solve and that kind of thing. So um, so those are the ways to to be in touch. Laura, it's been a real pleasure catching up with you. Um, uh, I, I love the insights you've given us today. Um, so thank you so much for your time, Laura. Yeah, you're most welcome, Patty. Thanks for the opportunity. It was a great conversation. <laughs>